Hello and welcome to the 2022 Earth Science Information Partners January Meeting Highlights webinar. My name is Megan Carter and I'm the Community Director with ESIP. Uh, this webinar it has the goal of highlighting key events from the meeting uh, from many different perspectives. So you'll hear from some ESIP leaders, from session organizers, from community fellows, as well as staff. Whether you weren't able to attend the meeting or you're looking to find out more about what happened, uh, we believe this webinar is for you, and we invite you to get involved in one or more of the efforts you see highlighted here today. And in fact, our big goal is hopefully to inspire you to do so. This webinar is being recorded, and it will be posted to the ESIP YouTube channel for later viewing uh, shortly after the webinar. If you have questions or comments at any time, we've provided a collaborative notes document. This is a bit of an experiment, but it's worked well in the past, uh, where we have sections for each of the presenters and places where you can uh, insert your questions or comments, and we hope to create discussion in that manner. And I will um, continually remind us of this document and hopefully be able to report that there's lots of activity there. And thanks for sharing the document in the chat. Um, please don't be shy to, to add your thoughts and questions there. So uh, next slide, please. Forgot for a moment that I am not controlling the slide deck. So ESA hosts two large uh, conference style meetings each year, typically in January and in July. We do this in order to create and connect, connect and create collaborative opportunities for individuals and organizations who are working across the data lifecycle and across sectors. These meetings are one of the ways that we help earth science data professionals to find each other, to work together and to leverage each other's collective expertise to make progress on common data challenges and opportunities, and ultimately to make earth science data more discoverable, accessible, and useful to researchers, practitioners, policymakers, and the public. Uh, next slide, please. The January meeting this year was held January 18th through the 21st online, and the theme was data for all people from generation to use and understanding. Next. For this virtual meeting, we leveraged tools like KikoChat, Zoom, Sketch, the ESIP Fake Share repository, Google Suite, particularly for collaborative notes documents, and Slido. We also used a tool called, called Wonder for our coffee breaks and other networking sessions. Our breakout session organizers also took part in session facilitation training again, led by the fabulous master facilitator, Charlie Haley. This was ahead of the meeting to support them in planning the best virtual sessions. And yet again, I think I speak for a lot of people when I say that um, the value of this training was really evident in the quality of the sessions. And I really appreciate the organizers who took the time to invest in this, um, in this training. Next slide. So we have asked our presenters to contribute their presentations to the ESIP FigShare portal. Uh, you can use the URL on the bottom right of the screen right now to access the meeting content that's been contributed so far. There you'll also find a lot of posters that were contributed to the research showcase uh, poster gallery. You won't hear much about those presentations today, so I especially encourage you to go to the FigShare repository and check those posters out. You can also find and access content uh, from the meeting at our Sketch site. You simply find the session that you're interested in and uh, click on it, look in the session description, and you'll see links to the notes, the presentations, and the recording itself. Of course, we'll keep adding content as it becomes available to us to the Figshare portal. So that's just the nudge for any organizers or presenters. Um, you can still contribute content, content that we'd love to share. Next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, or I didn't mention, I guess, all breakout and plenary session recordings can be found on the ESIP YouTube channel in this uh, nicely consolidated 2022 ESIP January meeting playlist. And the re recording of this webinar will also be there soon. So it's a, it's a cool place to check out and it's a cool place to point others to. So by the numbers, we had, uh, next slide, we had 311 total attendees. It was a um, pretty large meeting, including 106 first timers. The meeting featured three plenary sessions, 28 community led breakout sessions and workshops. And these sessions featured over a hundred people who served as either organizers and speakers. So it's really exciting that we don't just get people showing up to watch, but people showing up to contribute. On our next slide, you'll see 
our virtual photo of each other. Next slide, please. Yes, this is the virtual photo of us from Kiko Chat. Oh, sorry. And yeah, you see all those beautiful faces. So next, we will move to Susan Schingeldecker, ACIP's Executive Director, to highlight two of the plenary sessions. Thank you, Megan. Uh, next slide. So I get the privilege of designing um, our plenary sessions and, and figuring out who do we want to put on, on stage to, to showcase to the entire community. So our first plenary was focused on engaging Indigenous communities moving beyond principles to practice. Um, this was a panel of speakers um, that included Stephanie Russell Carroll from the University of Arizona, and she was joined by Emily Shaw, PhD candidate at Michigan Tech University, Kathleen Smith, a member of the Keweenaw Bay Indian Community and staff member of the Great Lake Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, and Valerie Gagnon, also a professor at Michigan Tech. So this session opened with Stephanie, and she was sharing her work on FAIR and CARE, which you can see here, um, and, and kind of the merging in the work of those two sets of principles. Um, later in the question and answer part of it, Stephanie um, made a really good point about the need to make space in our cyber infrastructure now for provenance and attribution as it relates to indigenous data. Um, and that was something that, I, that really struck with me in, in Stephanie's remarks. Emily then carried on um, and she really opened minds and got a really great reaction to her style of introduction. Um, where she used positionality and intentionality to introduce um, herself. Um, and then she also introduced the concept of research with, by, and as when working with um, indigenous communities and, and talked about how can we go from moving from extractive to self-determined research. Um, she introduced, as you can see here in this circle, the framework of the seasons of research that she developed with the Keweenaw Bay Indian community um, to incorporate respect, reciprocity, reverence, and responsibility through the phases of relationship building, planning and prioritization, knowledge exchange, synthesis and application. Um, and if you haven't taken a look at the more detailed version of this seasons of research, it's a really rich and beautiful document um, that I think could be um, built upon by many um, and was really excited to share that with the, with the whole community. And then lastly, we concluded with um, Val Gagnon and her work. And I thought I would just share the, the one, one of the most beautiful things that I thought she shared um, um, on the right here on the slide um, and her takeaway message to above all, prioritize land and life, be thoughtful, intentional, be deliberate, make evident, apply institutional, academic and scientific tools, methods and resources for the protection, restoration and revitalization of land and life. Second, know your subject, project, stakeholders, and rights holders, and know yourself. And finally, be humble, which requires an uncomfortable vulnerability. Uh, I, if you only have a couple minutes, I encourage you to listen to the question and answer section of this plenary. Um, really great discussion with all of the speakers, um, and I hope you all really enjoyed it. Next slide. So our second plenary section uh, or session was on open science and the private sector. Um, we started out with opening remarks from Microsoft. Um, they were our premier sponsor for the meeting and moved on to hear from the White House Assistant Director for Space Policy, Ezene Uzo Koro. She gave us a perspective on OSTP and USGO and how Earth observations fit into key White House priorities. She shared the concept of ferocious innovation that Dr. Eric Lander had um, mentioned previously a month earlier at AGU. And I just wanted to share again um, that ferocious innovation means setting bold goals, overcoming the fear of failure and focusing on how to succeed even on really hard problems and needing to try many possibilities in parallel um, and how public private partnerships are, are essential to fuel ferocious innovation. So from there, we heard from two CEOs, Kevin, uh, Allison Wolf from Vibrant Planet and Kevin O'Brien from Orbital Insight. Allison comes from Silicon Valley and a tech background, and Kevin, um, his background was in software development and, and financial technology or fintech. And I really love how the background of these two CEOs really impacts and informs their work and also their, their cultures at their organizations. They shared some of the tools that their firms have developed, um, specifically Land Tender and the Go platform. 
uh, with, with all of us. So for Vibrant Planet, Allison talked about needing to make trees more valuable living than dead and about needing consistent data structures at all scales down to the individual tree level for scenario modeling and the work that they're doing. She also talked about something that I get really excited about, the need to be strategic in restoration investments and prioritizing the most impactful investments, not just restoring the most acres for the least amount of money. She also hinted at the need for unlocking private capital markets um, for restoration at the scale that we need. And both that prioritized restoration and unlocking private capital requires really solid and sound data. Um, and I got really excited about the connection she was making there. Kevin O'Brien shared how Orbital Insight takes open source data sets, often you know, praising some really great federal data sets and combining them with other data um, whether it's sensor data or other proprietary data sets to answer their clients' questions, be they environmental questions, security questions, or humanitarian questions. He emphasized how asking questions opens doors for collaboration. Um, and he shared examples from mapping poverty for the World Bank and World Resources Institute to understanding security threats, looking for human trafficking, assessing sustainable supply chains, and again, like, like the opening plenary, if you listen to any part of this session, I encourage you to go to the Q&A session of, of, um, of the, the recording. You'll see in both plenaries how the passion of the ESIP community comes through and the quality of the questions that you ask. And actually, all the plenary speakers told me afterwards, they, they said, wow, you know, meeting, meeting, virtual meeting participation is, seems to be declining, but nobody told ESIP that, which, you know, just, just totally made me really, really smile. Um, in their Q&A, we had two CEOs getting excited about data management and the need for robust taxonomies and ontologies and enterprise level data to bridge silos. And when I see leaders of companies using these kind of terms, I get really excited. And I think these, these are people I, I really wanna work with. Um, so, I hope that you see that and you'll see the great discussion um, that we had also on data ethics and privacy um, and the power that we have to do so much good for our world. So I hope if you missed the plenaries, I hope you enjoy those recordings and, and catch them on YouTube. And with that, I think we'll move into the other sessions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Susan. So next up, as uh, Susan mentioned, we have the breakout session highlights. And these will be a series of very fast paced two minute lightning talks. I will keep a uh, rather strict time. So speakers, if you hear a rather pleasant sounding timer, that actually means your time is up and you should stop, please. Um, I've asked each presenter to provide information on how to learn more and how to get involved. So if you have any questions, please use that collaborative document that was shared in the chat. Maybe somebody can share that one more time. Um, this is a really good way to leave questions, to respond to questions, and to have a start a conversation that we can continue beyond the time that we have reserved here. So with that, we will now move to our first uh, presentation, which will be, I'm told, tag teaming between Denise Hills and Steve Richard, uh, sorry, Steve Diggs, talking about data on the break. <laughs> Yes, all those bearded Steves of the ESIP do kind of start running together <laughs> a little bit. Anyway, uh, my name is Denise Hills. I'm currently the ESIP VP. Um, uh, and uh, Steve? I'm Steve Diggs. I'm currently chair of Data Stewardship. And uh, we had a breakout session on data on the brink, improving data access and reusability. This is work in conjunction with our CoData task group. Um, it was a, a a very interactive session that had, we held up two um, data on the brink uh, examples up front. One was the Flint water data and the other one was a surprise was recovering Alvin video data as done by um, Woods Hole Oceanographic. Um, Denise? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so as Steve said, it was really, really interactive. One of the, one of my favorite parts of the session actually was not directly related to data on the brink, but it was how uh, we started the session. We did a, um, some popcorn style getting to know you exercises, which really helped so much of the work on data conservation needs to be collaborative. We need it works better when we know the people um, and we have bonds with the people. And so this this 
these introductory exercises really helped break the ice and made it more comfortable for us to talk about challenges that we have because there's a lot that we do right with data rescue and conservation, but there's a lot of mistakes that we've made along the way. And we need to be comfortable sharing not only our successes, but our failures. Um, so some big takeaways that we got were really small groups of dedicated people really do get things done. Um, and that's exciting and wonderful, but th there is so much to do. Um, what else, Steve, would, we came would away you with, like? Um... There was a questionnaire that we had at the end that was very informative when we gathered those data on sort of building a rubric to to both rescue data and to get um, data examples of data on the brink from the people who attended the session. So those were two really important takeaways that we couldn't have gotten without an interactive session. Right, right. Um, one of the other things that we talked about during that you know, during our session to kind of help set the stage um, with uh, some work that. Steve and I in particular and, and several others are doing with CoData, there is a task group um, titled Improving Data Access and Reusability. Uh, and one of the things that is coming out of that work is this idea that there are responsibilities and rights of people who are involved with data, whether they be researchers or institutions or the community um, or others. And so we're trying to outline uh, some of these rights and responsibilities um, so that to help improve data access and usability and reusability. Um, this is still kind of in early days. We're hoping to put this out uh, in a, a publication, um, but it, this may also be something that we bring towards ESIP for uh, ESIP adoption. Um, but we need feedback because we know that uh, there's a there's a bit.ly link or you can use the QR code and you can read what we have so far and you can comment on it and um, uh, give us some feedback. Otherwise, Thank you join so community much. resilience or in data stewardship. Denise and Steve, two minutes flies, right? There's so much more to catch up on there. So I encourage you all to visit those spaces as well. We will now move on uh, to a report out on improving fairness fairness and fairness of AI, ML, and geoscience, and that will be given by Jensen Sun. Thank you, Megan. Uh, hi, everyone. So um, our session talked about the fair or the fairness. The fair is like uh, uh, there is multiple fold of meanings across the entire, either the AI community or the ESEP community. Actually, in Facebook, it's called Facebook AI Research, which is fair as well. <laughs> Uh, so we kind of like want to talk all those things together in one session. So just, it's not focusing on one of the fairness or one on another. It's just the, uh, fostering all the discussion together and see which we can um, spark more thoughts and ideas about that. Uh, we invited several speakers. Daniel Cage talked about the fair principles, uh, focusing on the data and the software together because most of the effort right now is focusing on the data and there is no uh, best practice or uh, either standard or uh, recommendations on non-data objects like workflow software environments. Um, so there are many communities that are working on that and uh, we hope that ECIP can um, join, their, uh, join, join the efforts and uh, make their own uh, impact. Uh, Jianwu from EMBC also talked about his, uh, uh, his tool, how to integrate the service computing on the AWS uh, to automate the big data analysis. And Jimbo talked about the fair data uh, through the PODAC uh, S3 basket. And uh, all those efforts are made through the ESDS WG, uh, where that's basically all of the work is still ongoing. And uh, we hope that we can see more progress in the next few months of this year. Um, Michael also talked about the AI, use AI to manage land for uh, net zero carbon goals. And Nora talked about the review paper we published in last, last month. Um, I have talked about the recent progress of the machine learning cluster and uh, our plan is to write another paper on pract practical AI uh, in our season funds and anyone who are interested, please join the ML cluster and, uh, you know, uh, feel free to participate. Uh, that's it, Megan.
Thank you. Thanks so much, Jensen. And and uh, speakers, I'm, I'm moving to a different model of turning my camera on when you're basically out of time. Um, my chimes are pretty hard to hear, so we'll, we'll see how that goes, but you've been spot on on time so far. So next up, we will move um, to Amy, who's going to be telling us about unlocking ARCO, Analysis Ready Cloud Optimized Data Transformation in practice. So I'll turn it over to the Cloud Computing Cluster Chair. Cool, yeah, thanks. So we had um, we had a really great session. Uh, one of my takeaways was just that I I think the, the session format worked really well and that we had a series of lightning talks, um, which is followed by breakout groups where people could kind of introduce themselves and also reflect on the lightning talks themselves um, and then generate discussion questions. So based off of what they heard or what they came to the session being interested in, um, we used a Slido, which Annie Burgess helped me set up to basically pull the group for what questions would be the most interesting to the group. And that, that was used to, dis, to uh, basically mine what would be the most interesting questions to discuss as a group. So then we had a large group discussion um, and very fruitful, interesting conversation, very sort of meaty technical discussion. Uh, and then at the end, we had tutorials. Um, I think the only thing is the tutorials were had to be sort of brief, so we weren't able to dig in as much as possible. And so into the meat of the actual uh, session and our topic. So we were really interested in basically going from um, what people's experiences are generating analysis ready cloud optimized data. So that's like cloud optimized geotiffs and czar primarily in the focus of this group for um, our current state of the world. And what have people's experiences been and translating that into best practices was the original um, best practices and guides was the original concept for the session um, and it resulted in being a little bit more like what is the current state of the tools for doing this and what are people's experiences and just sharing those um, given that the final uh, takeaway in this set of bulleted in this bulleted list is that um, this ARCO space this analysis ready cloud optimized data format space is an evolving evolving technology and best practice space so we can't yet propose a set of solutions that will make sense for all or even most use cases. Um, so really wanted to drive home that we need to start with a clear use case and uh, there's tools like Kerchunk um, to support archival formats. That's all, thanks. Thanks very much, Amy. Uh, next up, we will pass the speaker role to Carl Benedict to talk about sustainable community repository networks. Sure. Um, yeah, we had a great session in which we uh, were focusing on trying to capture the insights and experiences of a variety of um, uh, players in the repository space, and especially in the, the space of repository networks, the, the, the collections of repositories that come together in different ways to uh, provide mutual support and sustainability for each other. We started out with uh, Four panelists, Amber Budden, uh, who uh, uh, provided some, some background on Data One's work towards sustainability, Kirsten Leonard uh, from the Geochemistry Data Facility, uh, IGSN, and also the Council of Data Facilities, where she dug a little bit more deeply in the work that they've been doing related to CDF. Daniela Lohenberg from Dryad, uh, talking about the work that they've been doing in sort of building their sustainability through collaborations with other repositories. And then Christine Kirkpatrick, uh, PI for the uh, EarthCube office, um, but also uh, broadly experienced in a lot of other networks. And what came out of this was uh, sort of the interesting individual case studies, but then also an emerging variety of strategies in terms of this sort of bottom-up approach that was illustrated um, by Dryad's work, um, the fee-for-service strategy that Data One is uh, pursuing as a way of diversifying the funding and support for the infrastructure and network that Data One has been engaged with and building. And then, of course, the idea of not just focusing on infrastructure, but also the communities around these repository networks. And 
ultimately we're seeing that there is this variety of approaches and we should look in all of them as we look forward to being able to sustain the communities and networks that we're working with and moving away from this typical award to award funding model for our repositories and our networks of repositories. Thank you. That was awesome timing, Carl. You caught me trying to mute my chimes right as you were ending. Thank you very much. All <laughs> right, you. so next up, we will be moving to Bob Downs, who will talk about enhancing the guidelines for sharing and reusing data set information quality. Oh, great, uh, thank you very much, Megan. And our session was organized by the Information Quality Cluster, a leadership team, including Yak Sing Wei, Yu Peng, David Moroni, Kampapura Rama Priyan, known as Rama, and myself. And we focused on international and interdisciplinary approaches for managing and sharing data quality information and discussed the uh, data set information quality guidelines and recommended enhancements for them. Uh, we had presentations from Yaksheng, Rama, Peng, and I, and we all talked about uh, uh, the information quality cluster and the development of the data set quality guidelines. We also had a, a presentation from Dr. Natalia Atkins of the University of Tasmania, who talked about data quality Australia's integrated marine observing system, known as IMOS, and how they're strengthening the uh, foundations of IMOS. We also had two breakout groups uh, and they reviewed elements of the guidelines. Um, and uh, uh, we had, uh, after those, we had report outs and based on those discussions, we have three takeaways. And that is to help those implementing the guidelines by sharing examples and caveats, suggested practices and a workflow. And the need to describe approaches for assessing compliance with the guidelines and engaging data users to get their feedback as well. So uh, please consider joining the information quality cluster and attending our monthly meetings on the fourth Tuesday at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, thank you very much. It must be very scary because everyone's keeping really good time. Uh, next, we will hear from Ryan McGranigan uh, on the session towards an earth and space sciences knowledge commons. Thank you, Megan. Thanks everyone for the attention. Uh, we had a, a really fantastic session that we're really excited about. Um, you can see just from the, the breadth of organizations that were involved in, in the convening, just from the individuals who contributed to it. Um, this is a group that cuts across NASA, the American Geophysical Union, MIT Knowledge Features Group, industry and academia. And it's a group that's been actively exploring this concept of the earth and space science knowledge commons. Um, and, and so the first idea of this was to introduce it to the ESIP community, this, this concept of the knowledge commons, because we really do believe that ESIP is the right community from which to start to develop these things, uh, because a lot of pockets of progress exist, and they can kind of speak to this from the earth and space science side. Uh, so just to introduce the session, the first thing we wanted to do was to understand what a knowledge commons was. And so we, we define this as the combination of intelligent information representation, and the open ends governance and, governance and trust required to create a participatory ecosystem whereby the whole community maintains and evolves the shared information space. So I put that there, it's, it's kind of a mouthful, but I think you'll start to see, and we already have received a lot of feedback from people who attended the session across ESIP, commonality with a lot of our groups and a lot of the efforts that are going on across ESIP. The Knowledge Commons are not trying to reinvent those. They're trying, it's, it's, it's a means to bring all those together and understand the relationships between them so that individuals can, can find those pieces of software or other technologies that uh, might, might help them do what they're doing. So we, we think of Knowledge Commons as a core technology, and this was introduced during the first portion of the session, which was kind of a fishbowl conversation with um, Kellen Coward from JPL, Ellie Young from Common Action, and uh, SJ Klein from MIT Knowledge Futures Group, kind of envisioning what a Knowledge Commons looks like. This introduced everyone to the concept and started to help us think about what the critical dimensions of this would be for ESIP and the earth and space sciences. We captured a lot of the animating questions that people were asking uh, in a mirror board and that's available through the notes. You can find the link there. Um, but really the motivation for this session was to gather and explore ways to structure and produce collective knowledge about our sciences and how 
this involves not only software development and knowledge graph development, but also the cultural side of things about how we interact with those and how we make those more usable and, re and, and frameable. So after that, we had a really wonderful and wide reaching panel with pioneers of knowledge commons in various dimensions. So that helped us explore those dimensions in a little more depth and establish how you can get involved which are two, and I'll, I'll finish here with this pub pub space collection. This is a, an area for people to write short blog posts or essays around this to help us understand what's going on. And, and then finally, this is just the beginning. There's many virtual workshops happening and ongoing in these different dimensions. Um, so I welcome you to reach out to me and get involved. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ryan. I think this is just the beginning for a lot of things and I'm really excited for how this webinar has gone so far. I will now pass the speaker role to Julie Lowndes, who will tell us about better science for future us planning for the year of open science. Great, uh, thanks everyone and hello. Um, so I'm Julie Lowndes and I co-direct Openscapes with Aaron Robinson. And our session was um, called Better Science for Future Us, planning for the year of open science. Our goals were to increase the visibility and the value of open science within government and support the bright spots who are already doing this work through letting them have the opportunity to share their stories. And our focus is really on supporting researchers. Um, so these are speakers from, um, from NOAA Fisheries, from Cal EPA, from NASA, from some of the NASA DACs, and also from um, historically black colleges and universities were really sharing their stories on how they as researchers and or as supporting researchers sort of fit into this whole open science and data science world. Um, so this, in a, this illustration shows kind of how the tooling, which is so key and central, um, really are connected to the outer ring, which is sort of science and teams and asking questions through the practices and the shared practices that they have. So helping researchers develop these shared practices around tooling for their science is really our focus. Um, our three takeaways that came out through the, the both throughout the, the uh, speaker sessions and then also throughout the discussion were that um, both top-down and grassroots efforts are necessary so there were stories about how in NOAA fisheries, researchers who are learning new tooling and open data sharing are, are, are um, interested in um, communicating and getting more of a majority go, um, interested in open data and open data science at NOAA fisheries. And then separately how an initiative like NASA that is purporting um, open science from the top also relies on grassroots efforts to actually see what that means and, and see when we need Jupiter hubs or whatnot. Um, we need to dissolve silos by supporting early adopter bright spots that already do exist um, and helping them have communication channels to find each other and to support each other. Um, and finally, to re reuse and rebuild, uh, reuse and build from existing tooling and efforts, whether that's code or also whether that's creating space and place and supporting each other. We'll share this more on a blog. And um, thanks so much um, for your time. Thank you, Julie. Next up, we will hear about something very exciting: applying use cases to the biological data standards primer. Robert McGuinn. Hey, everyone. Uh, sorry not to be on video. I'm on a low bandwidth connection today. But um, yeah, we had a great session. I'm, I'm with, uh, I'm the co chair of the biological data standards cluster, along with Abby Benson, our fearless leader, and Diana Lascala Greenwald, and also uh, Aaron Satherwaite. So we organized a session where we Oh, in the chat, I've put the link to our primer, which we're working on It's sort of an infographic that's targeted at new data managers and trying to get them involved in biological data standards development and uh, data curation work. And so as part of our development of that primer, we wanted to kind of bring together each element of that's represented on the primer, the first one being metadata, and sort of flesh that out and, and get it out there with the community. So we had an expert panel where we, where we explored three, or I'm sorry, four different uh, metadata standards for that can be used with biological data. Um, and biological observation data in particular. And then we had a uh, simplified data set that we had the participants run through in breakout sessions and kind of describe and discuss why they would use one standard or another. And I think it really um, helped people understand the kind of differences between these standards. 
But our takeaways were um, that this is very useful to hear about these different strengths and weaknesses of the standards. It was particularly interested in these lightning talks to hear about um, their the, the experts' opinions about how these standards apply to biological data in particular. It was very um, apparent too that people really did want to understand how these uh, different standards would crosswalk between one another and sort of their future development. And it seemed like a possible new task that really emerged from this is, is um, really picking up and running with an existing biological data profile that's in ISO. Um, one exists right now, but it's underused and unratified. So thanks so much. Please join our um, biological data standards uh, cluster. There's links um, in, the, in the notes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Robert. So I would like to take a one minute pause, uh, as many of you may have learned in the session uh, facilitation training. It's good to, to leave a minute or two for folks to kind of make sense of what they've just heard. So I invite you to go take a look at the Q&A document. I see some activity there. I challenge you to add something somewhere, a question, a comment, anything. I'll give you one minute. All right, in case you're wondering, I timed my one minute because it is very hard to leave space, uh, leave silence, leave space for silence. I want to uh, welcome Leslie Shi. Leslie, thank you for letting me break in before your presentation on building stronger bridges between collaborations. Thank you, Megan. I co-led this breakout session with Megan Carter, the one and only Megan Carter. We both coordinate collaboration areas, Megan for ESIP and myself for the USGS Community for Data Integration. The goal of our session was to connect related ESIP and CDI groups and activities, specifically in the area of risk, resilience, and disasters. We also took some time to examine how cross-group connections are formed and sustained. So we had five excellent early career and fellows presenters talk about their collaboration areas and their work. Matt Georgonis, Marion McKenzie, Christine Gregg, Chen Huang, and Lindsay Barbieri. After the presentations, we did a group mapping exercise, part of which you can see in the image here where attendees indicated a level in, of engagement that they wanted with these different groups they heard about. This helped to emphasize that there are different levels of involvement from learning more, getting updates, and active collaboration. So three takeaways are, first, slow down, take time, get clear on your own group's purpose and how new connections with other groups can advance your own purpose. Second, when you make a connection, you tap into a new network where work is being done. That means you don't have to do the same work or do or know everything. Now you can consult your new connection. And third, ESIP CDI and other communities should continue to create these opportunities and take the time to foster connections. And thanks to the many others who are already doing this as we saw in many ESIP sessions and activities. So please get in touch with me if you'd like to learn more about CDI collaboration areas and I'll share a link in the chat. Thank you so much, Leslie. It was a pleasure leading that session with you. Now we will move to Gary Bird Cross, who will talk about Wikidata, a knowledge graph for the Earth Sciences. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Gary Bird Cross, one of the organizers of this uh, Wikidata session, uh, along with Chuck Vardaman and Jane Weingard. We each briefed for about 15 minutes, followed by a general discussion. As noted in the slide, Wikidata's storage architecture is designed as a free and open knowledge base that can be read, queried, edited by both humans and machines 
Uh, the idea for ESIP is that building the other wiki efforts, wiki data can showcase fair, compliant, central storage for structured data is that uh, some of the researchers in ESIP can make use of. It might be populated with earth science data and information and in turn serve as a source for earth science knowledge graphs. Special presentations by Albin Larson and Jan Anali on editing Wikidata will provide information on how Wikidata works and how links uh, can be used for joining open discussions that take place regularly. Takeaways included information on a hackathon active data community with tools such as a relative completeness tool called RealCon, Recon, and external ID supporting data crossworks. An example is spatial information about NEON sites, which is interest to the ESA uh, community. However, many earth science topics are not yet deeply populated uh, in uh, Wikidata compared to life sciences, which has, for example, a database of biological pathways called Wiki Pathways. In comparison to earth sciences, the bio area has encyclopedic coverage, but we might start adding earth science data to Wikidata. Payne and Chuck provided drone data examples for leveraging Wikidata using an API streaming link data. You can check Wikidata for land is science drone information. Uh, talked about, it could be used as a model for entering information. Our third takeaway comes from Wikidata examples of soil, permafrost, and glaciers, some of which are shown in the diagram on our page. <clears throat> Wikidata knows a good deal about glaciers, but less about soil and cryotypes of soil, like permafrost, or material transformation processes like nivation. I discussed how to harmonize earth science data to build and now popular knowledge graphs using lessons from the semantic harmonization plus the effort. There were many benefits in populating a source like Wikidata using well-established schemas and common relations, and where possible, reusing design patterns to support data interoperability. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Next up, we'll hear about recent advances in marine data management from Matthew Biddle. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. Um, hi, I'm Matthew Biddle. Uh, our session was on recent advancements in marine data management. Uh, the session was a collaboration between the marine data cluster and the biodata standards cluster. And the idea of the session was to highlight recent activities and facilitate collaboration and information sharing across sub-disciplines of marine data. Uh, the session was organized into four 10-minute talks that was followed by open discussion. Uh, the talks included leveraging eDNA for biodiversity using Darwin Core, and this was presented by Diana Lascala Greenwald from Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. The next talk was an intermediate data model for extracting plankton and other particle observations from images, and this was presented by Stace Beaulieu from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Uh, the next talk was uh, the EarthCube Marine Ecological Time Series Research Coordination Network and how they are working towards a fair data model. Uh, and that was presented by Heather Benway from uh, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and Fernando Pacheco from the University of Hawaii. Uh, the final talk was the Shipboard Automated Meteorological and Oceanographic Systems Development of an XML Metadata Exchange. And this was presented by Sean Smith from Florida State University. And now the presentations were fantastic, but the discussion that we had at the end was actually more riveting. Um, we, we covered topics from how to get funding agencies involved into these data management topics to managing data at an atomic level. So I highly recommend taking a look at that recording and, and seeing those different discussion topics. Um, one of the other neat things that actually came out of it was during one of the happy hours, we, there was a, uh, conversations about potential collaborations between the marine data cluster, biological data, and semantic harmonization clusters. So I want to give a big thank you to ESIP for providing that wonder space to have those conversations. Uh, and that's it. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Matt. It's nice to hear about um, all the ways you engaged at the meeting and, and the value that you found there. And I, I echo that discussions section of the of sessions are often just as valuable, if not more valuable than the presentations themselves. So next up, we will hear from Dave Jones, I believe, on understanding the significance of the SBIR STPR program, its phases and technologies and how your organization can benefit. Hi, Megan. Thanks. Uh, yeah, this was kind of a, a different uh, session. Uh, Bob Chen and, and I ran this one uh, because the SPIR and STTR uh, programs are kind of 
not well known. And uh, we wanted to provide an opportunity for members of ESIP to participate in this session to see how they might be able to, to contribute. Um, Bob Chen made a, a great point. Uh, actually, we were chatting uh, back and forth here saying that these are real kind of rare public private partnership opportunities where you can bring to the table, if you're a small business, innovation and make that innovation uh, relevant to an agency need. And if you get selected for that, uh, that opportunity and then uh, you spend six months to develop a prototype, the government can come back and say, hey, this is unique. We want you to develop the technology. And so they'll, they review your phase two proposal. And if they like it, they can fund it. And uh, all of a sudden you start to get closer and closer to an opportunity where you become a sole source provider to the federal government for that technology innovation. Uh, Bob uh, covered the STTR program, which is a technology transfer uh, program where small business partner with research institutions uh, one of the success stories that was highlighted for STTR uh, was the Dante project that was developed by iSciences uh, Season up at Columbia University and Case International for the U.S. Um, Army Corps of Engineers. And so uh, when a research institution works together with a private company, uh, they can actually create a unique pathway for contracting. And so uh, we had uh, Jason Kessler from NASA, who is an SBIR program executive, talking about what opportunities they have now. As a matter of fact, they have phase one uh, proposals that are due March 9th. So you still have room if you're a small business and you want to see what opportunities exist. As a matter of fact, any agency that has a research budget of $100 million or more should put aside 4 to 5% of their research budget for SBIR innovation from small businesses, which is really uh, quite fabulous. And uh, we talked about also NSF opportunities. So search through federal agencies and SBIR, see if there are opportunities there for you. And also through the STTR program, if you want to partner with the university uh, organization to uh, really get technology transferred into the operational area. So it was great. And uh, hope you can check out the, uh, the wiki. It was really sponsored by the public private partnerships cluster. And um, it was just a, a fabulous response. We're hoping to have more uh, small business opportunity uh, sessions like this in future ESIP meetings. So that's it, Megan. Thank you, Dave. I was just taking a look at our Q&A document and seeing, seeing some questions and answers there from our speakers. So keep at it. Um, no question is too small or comment. Um, it's greatly appreciated your contributions there. And then one thing I'll note is that at the top of that document, I've actually linked the slides from this webinar today. So if you're noticing that you can't catch everything on the screen as it flies by, please visit the, the slides in our FigShare repository. And with that, we'll move to our next presentation, which will be Understanding Schema.org, exploring its utility for research data on the web and Steve Richard. Hi, Steve Richard. Um, this uh, Understanding Schema.org session was run by the Schema.org cluster. Um, it was organized by Adam Shepard. And uh, the cluster is working on standardizing, um, developing recommendations for metadata to describe science data using the Schema.org vocabulary, which was developed by a consortium of, of uh, major search providers, Google, Yahoo, Bing, a couple others. And uh, we have a set of recommendations um, that we've been working on for a couple of years. Um, we have a version 1.3 now. So during the, uh, during the session, um, we had some presentations from active users of the current recommendations from Data One, um, the EarthCube Geocodes Aggregator, the uh, Magnetics con Consortium, and uh, representatives from the Council of Data, some of the data repositories at the Council of Data Facilities discussing um, how they've been using schema.org and also reviewing some of the challenges that have arisen and some of the successes. Um, the uh, discussion then moved to the version 1.3 release, which is upcoming. And we, the cluster is going to be seeking endorsement from the ESIP community for these recommendations to try to get them some, some more authority and hopefully promote adoption from the, the wider community. Um, there's a series of documents we're working on that, and we hope that, that we'll be able to bring that forward at the summer meeting that's coming up. 
All the work we're doing is on GitHub. Um, the URL for the GitHub repository is there. You can see the recommendations. And uh, if you want more information, please contact Adam Shepard, who's sort of been spearheading this group. And um, we're looking for as much participation as we can get to look at these and, and get a good set of metadata recommendations for more effective data discovery and reuse. Thanks. Thank you very much, Steve. So next up, we are going to hear from Catherine Unsworth, who hopefully is actually sleeping right now in Australia. Uh, so she was nice enough to record a little uh, presentation for us. Hi, everyone. I'm Catherine Unsworth. I lead the Skilled Workforce Development Group at the Australian Research Data Commons, also known as ARDC. Nancy Hubel Heinrich of Knowledge Motifs LCC and I co facilitated a session at the ESIP Winter 2022 meeting on global efforts to improve the discoverability and reusability of training materials. I'll just switch off my camera so that you can see the full slide. The main aims of our session were to bring our participants up to speed on current collaborative efforts to increase the discoverability of education and training materials and assess their utility from different stakeholder perspectives. We also wanted to shine a light on new platforms for finding and using training materials, such as the newly developed National Training Portal in Australia, Digital Research Skills Australasia, otherwise known as DRESA. The real focus of the session and subsequent discussions was metadata schemas. Although we had a smallish number of participants, the discussions were engaging and very on point. Our three takeaways, as you can see, have a particular metadata theme, metadata application profiles or maps. It might be useful to explain what a map is and why would we use one. It's a list of properties that are considered valid for a metadata schema and which help determine the correct usage of that schema. Our MAPS discussions focused on the benefits of developing a readily adoptable map for the RDA minimal metadata set for learning resources. MAPS can greatly aid FAIR implementations metadata schema with the emphasis on interoperability. There's a real value in the ability to harvest and re-harvest metadata for training learning resources from one platform to another. And for this to happen, standard representation is incredibly important. Maps don't have to be complex, even simple representations allow for the exchange of information at greater scale, such as that of the Dublin Core Tabular Application Profile DCTAP, which provides a template for tabular representations of metadata schemas. A link to the DCTAP primer has been included in the slide. The next phase for implementation of the RDA minimal metadata set for learning resources will be to, to develop a human readable map as a first step with the potential to also develop it in a machine readable format. If you'd like to be involved in this work or want to know more, please contact Nancy. If you'd like to know more about the Digital Research Skills Australasia training portal, please contact me, Catherine. Thank you so much. That's me for now. All right, we will, we will thank Catherine later, but please uh, feel free to leave her questions or comments in the notes doc and we'll make sure that she and Nancy are able to address them. So next we will hear from Robert Rovetto, who will be telling us about two different sessions that he was a part of. The first one uh, was about community development of the sweet semantic system for earth and environmental data. We call for interest. Thanks, Megan. For this session, uh, a couple of the goals were to provide a historical and current overview of the uh, suite system uh, and bring together people interested in it. Uh, it would, so another goal was also to explore the development tasks and uh, solicit some interest from uh, potential contributors. So suite is a, a living set of ontologies and it has origins in NASA JPL. Uh, it supports a number of uh, of applications and functionalities such as semantic tagging, uh, model and grid interoperability, and data search and retrieval. It has historical precedent to develop, to be developed to greater complexity uh, through past visions of, uh, of its development from the original developers. During the session, we had uh, a number of candidate development tasks that uh, that were uh, uh, mentioned, including developing local definitions and adding functions, uh, potential hackathons, 
quality assurance by potential subject matter experts and a number of other potential candidate tasks. Uh, for this session, we generated some interest as uh, there were a number of participants uh, in attendance. And this is, uh, as a semantic system, it's under the uh, semantic technology cluster. Uh, suite being transitioned from NASA to uh, ESA purview around 2017. Relevant uh, keywords are on the bottom left here. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, you can contact me at that email. The presentation uh, for this session is at the link below on the bottom right on FigChair and uh, the GitHub uh, as well. Thank you. And we will now reintroduce Robert to tell us about the second of those sessions, uh, a framework for knowledge organization and modeling of space data from astronomy to near Earth space activities. Thank you again, Megan. The purposes of, uh, of this session was to bring people interested in space data together. Space data broadly construed from space sciences to space flight or astronomy and uh, astronautics, as well as subdisciplines and people interested in knowledge modeling broadly construed as well. So this was for the purpose of uh, space domain knowledge management, which includes various tasks from knowledge organization to uh, knowledge structuring and dissemination and sharing. Some of the takeaways for this uh, session was the existence of a space ontology project uh, by myself, which may serve as a, a framework or a set of knowledge models for communities such as ESIP, uh, artificial intelligence communities, semantic groups, and so forth. And it consists of an effort to develop a number of uh, ontologies, control vocabularies, and other knowledge organization systems for, for a set of target uh, space-related uh, disciplines and topics. And this may be possibly towards uh, the concept of a uh, space knowledge network or set of space knowledge networks for the broader community. And this takeaway also involves a call for interest and ideas on, uh, on how to support and develop this project. And it is actively seeking sustainable support to further develop. Another takeaway is through the one of our speakers during this session, Kurt Cagle out of uh, Data Science Central. Uh, he pointed out uh, and discussed how graph technology and current metaverse concepts involve questions relevant for space data and knowledge modeling. Uh, this Speaker also uh, made us aware of an interesting project called SOLID, which involves uh, some technologies called pods. Again, the keywords for the session are on the bottom left. Uh, you can also click on the orbital debris uh, link, which goes to a, a past ESIP uh, presentation. And on the bottom right, you can contact me at that email and visit the, uh, the first takeaways website uh, on the bottom right as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Robert. All right, so we have now reached uh, one of the parts of our Meeting Highlights webinars that I personally am most excited about. And this is when we get to hear about the meeting through the eyes of our community fellows. We're gonna hear from three of the eight of them today, uh, and they are phenomenal. We ask them to report out on any part of the meeting that they want to share through their own eyes. So I'm very excited to see what they have to share today. First up, we will hear from Daniel Segesenman, uh, who supports the Data Stewardship Committee. He will be telling us about public questions versus open data sets in US federal environmental governance. Hello, everyone. As Megan said, I'm Daniel Segesman, an uh, ESIP Community Fellow. And this was one of the sessions that I actually uh, was working to support, but I also really found it to be quite interesting. So the session was public questions versus open data sets in US federal environmental government. So that's a mouthful, but we did a lot of activities or learning through uh, uh, application, right? So they, they would task us with go find or try to get a view of this specific data from this website. So in this case, environmentalenforcementwatch.org. And it's a website that, uh, looks to try and get a lot of different government data, especially environmental data um, that is produced by the US federal government and make it accessible and open to try and make sure that, uh, you know, different organizations, corporations, federal uh, agencies, et cetera, are following environmental policies. Uh, and so it was just a really interesting way of approaching um, this 
this uh, website and uh, the session uh, leaders were individuals who are involved with the development of the website. So they were looking for feedback from participants. And so my takeaways from this were that it was really important to test and get feedback on your data platform to improve its accessibility. So have people who have never interacted with it at all who aren't involved with its development come in and try to use it. Uh, there are a lot of US federal government data sets pertaining to environmental data. I've never really delved into trying to get data out of these systems before. And I was uh, uh, surprised at how variable they are uh, in their accessibility and utility. It was really a labyrinth to try and navigate uh, some of those data sets. Uh, and even spending, you know, part of the session, we spent 15 to 30 minutes helping fill in metadata, such as does this data set website have an API where you can get data out of? Or does this website have a built-in visualization tool? And even just knowing that much information so that people can look at a list and be like, oh, here's an environmental uh, data set that has an API. So I'm going to be able to pull data out of that for uh, any sort of analysis. And so it was just a really interesting session that I thought uh, was worth bringing up. And uh, ESIP as a whole, the, the January meeting was really excellent and uh, probably the best virtual conference I've attended and I've attended a few in the pandemic. And if you want to learn more, contact uh, Kelsey Bresman and I have the, uh, her information linked there. Uh, and uh, if you want to learn more about the data stewardship committee, uh, I have the link to the telecon in the email list there as well. Thank you so much, Daniel. I agree. I was in attendance at this session as well, and, and think it's a really great one to revisit if you're if you have uh, a desire to go back and watch some of the recordings. But thanks for your highlights on that. Next, we will move to Chen Wang, who will talk about ESIP's uh, cross-domain collaboratory. Let's look at wildfires, and this was hosted by the Disaster Lifecycle Cluster. Thank you, Megan. Hi, I'm Chen Huang, is a fellow of the Disaster Lifecycle Cluster. The session I highlighted today is the ESIP Cross Domain Collaboration Laboratory Let's Look at Wildfires, organized by the Disaster Lifecycle Cluster. So in the session, we examined the um, wildfires to access the ESIP ecosystem of innovation, providing data to decision makers so they can take immediate action. So the Ecosystem of Innovation is a framework created by Dave Jones and designed to help ESIP clusters address real-world use cases and put into use uh, operational developments. And this session attract attracted around like 50 attendees. And at the beginning of the session, we surveyed where people get Wi-Fi information, uh, how they decide whether or not uh, uh, whether to trust or not, and what data could help during the pre-file stage. And here's a screenshot of the poor result. Uh, we got some very valuable takeaways. First, we identified a critical need of communicating data to people who need to know. Second, we need, to, we need trusted information for wildfire incidents with the use of ORL ranking. So the ORL model is a tool that allows us to trans, uh, translate the operational readiness of a data set from a technical data to an easy to understand uh, standardized ranking one to four from the highest to the lowest. And third, we need to expand the public access to local warnings and evacuations. Also, we need to partner with local organizations. So in the future, we will have our summer ESIP meeting session talking about a wildfire response and a winter meeting 2023 talking about the post wildfire recovery and mitigation. Uh, if you want to know more information, please contact uh, Karen, Dave, and me and join Disaster Life Lifecycle Cluster mailing list. And our cluster meeting is on the first Thursday of every month at 45 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you. Thank you so much. So next up, we will hear from Jim Call, who is uh, the fellow with the Cloud Computing Cluster, and he'll be talking about his general experience and highlights in the OGC disaster pilots session, pilot session called Global ARD to Local DRI, where DRI means decision ready indicators, in case anybody's wondering. All right, I also needed help with the acronym. So, hi everyone, my name is Jim Call. I have the pleasure of being the last person on the schedule between you and lunch, so I'll keep this sweet. Um, but I just echo one of the most common points I heard through the whole uh, 
conference, which was the, this was an incredible platform and very well organized uh, and well documented meeting. And that made a huge difference uh, on the back end. So I think every conference from here on out, if it's not documented, I think it gets a little ESIP, ESIP ding against it. Um, but uh, so from our session, it was a, a really informative and demo driven session. So there was a, a, one of the takeaways that I saw from uh, all of the presentations that we were given was there's still a lot of friction to go from analysis ready data to decision ready indicators. Uh, and one of the most common pain points uh, vocalized by people in the session was the, the disconnect between researchers and practitioners of, of disaster response. Um, so if anyone on this call happens to have an in for that, uh, please reach out to us. Um, I'll also point out, uh, I wouldn't be doing my fellow duty if I didn't say the cloud computing cluster deals with a lot of uh, analysis ready data. So uh, our call uh, is February 28th. At one, we had some demonstrations of Geo Collaborate and Gizmo, uh, which really sort of uh, kind of primed us to explore some geographic context behind that data uh, and really kind of frame some of these questions. And then um, uh, the OGC geospatial data encryption standards were demonstrated. Uh, and it's my hope that this kind of exposes some of that PII data. Uh, so that we can harvest some knowledge from it in a, a meaningful and sensitive way. So thank you, Megan. Thank you, Jim. All right, so we will take one more one minute pause to review our Q&A document, make sure there aren't any lingering questions that we have for anyone or um, any questions that maybe the speakers haven't yet seen from others. And then we will do a really quick wrap up. And if you're having any trouble um, editing the document, try refreshing. I did have a couple of people need to do that. All right, uh, next slide, please. Perfect, all right, so that was an impressive uh, lineup. I think I don't have to say that. I think you all got to experience that. I'm really grateful for all of the speakers who showed up today to uh, give these report outs and who really worked hard to condense a ton of content into a few succinct points. Um, certainly, this is only the beginning in a lot of cases, but I hope that a lot of you uh, were inspired or got excited. And if there's anything you want to follow up on, there are a lot of places to follow up. Um, but if you have any questions, the ESIP staff can always help you um, make sure you end up in the right place. I want to remind everyone that there are a lot of ways to jump in and get involved in ESIP before our next meeting, which will be in July. And we're very active all year long and you're welcome in any and all existing collaborations. I always like to say no need to RSVP. If you see a call on the ESIP Telecon calendar, which you can find at esipfed.org slash telecon, please click and join and, and speak up about what um, what's interesting to you or what challenges you're dealing with. And um, I really encourage you to try out a number of different spaces to see what you might find. You might also consider applying for ESIP lab support. Uh, these are, are great small funding sources for good ideas ready to be tried out. Um, Annie Burgess is a great point of contact to learn more about that. Um, you can also encourage your organization to become a partner if they are not already. And of course, you heard from three of our phenomenal ESIP community fellows. That's an opportunity we want to uh, broadcast more widely so that everybody knows because we think it's it's a really good one so please um, consider applying or encouraging others to apply 
And we definitely encourage you to uh, engage in whatever way that you think is most useful for you. So finally, if you're not already subscribed, uh, next slide, I encourage you to join the ESIB Monday update mailing list. Um, our communications manager, Allison, who's uh, so graciously sharing the slides right now and um, invisible, uh, but she is uh, very visible in the Monday update and in many other ESIB spaces, kind of revolutionary, revolutionizing this uh, weekly newsletter to really make sure you get all the important things you need to know. Um, one message that really um, helps you be better involved in the ESIP community. So with that, I will say that uh, this brings our webinar to a close. Thank you again to our speakers, uh, our session leads who really push the envelope in terms of their session design. We also um, don't wanna fail to mention our federal sponsors, NASA, NOAA, and the USGS and the support that they provide that is um, incredibly critical to what we do. We're also grateful to our meeting sponsors, Microsoft, Element 84, and AGU who really helped us take this meeting up a notch. Um, and finally, yeah, just as a reminder, this webinar will be available on the ESIP YouTube channel.